Disclaimer. This episode features strong language throughout. Incoming transmission. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. You're in a place where they're trying to enlighten you and educate you and train you, but they're also trying to break you down and build you up the way they want you to be. This is your third installment of True Spies Tradecraft. You're about to dive into the secret world of espionage. Peer behind the curtain of tradecraft secrets. Are you ready? They feared retribution, so that was a threat which we played to the hilt. What do you do for a living? Are you good with numbers? Can you multitask? Are you a team player? Whatever the cliche, there's a high chance you had to do some training for the job you're in. Apart from the threat of death or imprisonment, in this spying world, it's not much different. However, the skills you learn to be an operative have a name. Tradecraft. But where do you go to learn the skills that will give you these tools? Well, in the FBI, they call it the school. But having your lunch money stolen is the least of your worries. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all, and it was not easy. We had other agencies and other establishments come in and tell us, you guys are crazy for doing this kind of stuff. This is Giovanni Rocco from episode 77 of True Spies. He worked for years as an undercover FBI agent in some of the most dangerous gangs in the US. But to get to that, he had to go through some rigorous FBI training. It took my previous training before I had the FBI school and, and injected steroids into it. They'll deprive you of sleep and then they'll just strip you physically of everything you have in you. And then they'll begin to train you because it, it mimics that extreme stress of having to negotiate under extreme pressure. You know, your body's pumping adrenaline. You're not negotiating in, you know, corporate trades on Wall Street. You're in some crack den or sitting with some Sicarios or some heavy hitters. So you have to learn how to do these things under extreme pressure. So they give you the proper training to prepare you, conducting any kind of operation. Skills like identifying when someone is showing fear or weakness through subconscious body language, or tick and tells, as it's known in the spy world. Noticing when someone is lying or nervous is vital to an undercover operative success. Noticing a weak point that can be squeezed for information. In my world, if I read you and I sit there and I'm watching you tap, it's just why are you tapping, you know? Useful in situations, say, when you're talking about illegal drugs with potential clients and buyers. If I start talking numbers and I start talking prices for whatever I'm moving with you and the business we're doing, and that price is not the number, I could tell by your tick and tell. What do you do when you're nervous? Is there something you do that shows others you're feeling uncomfortable? This wasn't an option for Giovanni. To be a really good undercover operative and stay alive, you need to hide your tick and tell. But how? Well, everything is easier when you remember to breathe. Heart rate variability is everything. Breathing is everything, you know? Um, and everybody's been in a situation where you, you have that jackrabbit heart. It's racing at a million miles a minute and you can't control it. And next thing you know, you, your voice gets elevated. Your voice starts to crackle. You start to stutter. Well, if you just take a deep breath and you slow your speech, you can think clearer. You kind of regulate yourself and then you can actually have a full conversation without saying something stupid that you should not say. Breathing. Okay, got it. Thanks, Giovanni. So you've been to the school. What now? They wanted me to manipulate, to exploit, to subvert, to suborn people, foreign people, to get them to commit treason, to betray a trust. Oh yes, the nitty gritty. Betrayal features heavily in True Spies. You know, your parents probably taught you never betray your country, never betray your family. And yet the CIA expected me to do exactly that. And I found out 
that not only was I pretty good at it, but I enjoyed it a lot. Enter Jim Lawler, CIA operations officer for 25 years. He's a self-confessed sociopath, which does help in his line of work, an unofficial entry into the book of tradecraft secrets. A good psychiatrist friend of mine once said, Jim, you're nothing but a sociopath, but one within lanes. Those lanes are US laws. A sociopath, if you're unfamiliar with the term, is a person who lacks empathy, who feels little to no genuine remorse for their immoral or amoral actions. A person for whom manipulation is as natural as breathing and deceit is second nature. And how he recruited his most valuable asset is a prime example of this. But let's rewind a little. A quick recap from episode 63, The Sociopathic Spy. Jim has an asset that is giving him golden information. However, this asset has an asset of their own. A secretary working for a high-ranking official in a hostile nation. Jim's asset suggests cutting out the middleman, going straight to the source. The initial meeting goes swimmingly and lays the foundation for a mutually beneficial relationship. Now, this is where it gets interesting, as Jim now has to pitch to the potential asset what he wants from her. And to make her take the bait, he has to sweeten the deal. But how? Well, in the world of tradecraft, it's all about leverage. What have you got that they need? This young woman had a medical condition that required a uh, procedure that was going to cost her the equivalent of about $5,000. And she didn't have the money, so it helps to be a bit of a sociopath in these circumstances. When I found out that she needed this medical procedure and that it was going to cost about $5,000, I knew that this was the kind of thing that would sweeten the whole moment. You have to look at the bigger picture of what Jim is trying to do, serve his country, one lunch date at a time. So on the second meeting, I made her a commercial consulting proposal. I said, look, I'm willing to pay you so much a month to be my consultant. And, and you know what? To, to sweeten the deal, I'll throw in $5,000 as a little signing bonus. She was overjoyed. However, there's a problem. Jim has to do the right thing and tell this new asset that she is really working for the CIA. So on a third meeting, he tells her, she backs out of the deal. Fair enough. It's not over though. Is he really willing to give up this hugely valuable asset when he was a hair's breadth away from securing her? Would any good operative worth their salt give up? Of course not. And I got down to the train station in the city in which she lived, and I trudged through that train station, kind of thinking, this is doom. I saw a little gift shop and I thought, well, the decent thing to do would be to go buy her a little farewell present. So I went into the store and I saw a um, about an eight inch high bud vase, very delicate. It must have cost me maybe $50 really. And so I uh, put it in a little plastic bag and I went off to my hotel. And then I went to the dinner. The perfect setting for a bit of undercover seduction. Low music. Absolutely fabulous cuisine, fabulous wine, extremely romantic. From the time he'd already spent with the asset, he had a feeling that she'd be susceptible to a little well-placed male attention. She was living with her mother. Here she was in her early 30s, not married yet, which in her culture basically meant that she was probably going to be living with her mama for the rest of her life. Charming, but not technically untrue. Another weak point spotted. Jim exploits it. I set this gift wrap box in front of her, and she said, so what's this, Jack? I said, well, just open it. So she opened it, and she put it in front of her. And I said, I'd like you to take this back when you go home in a few weeks. And, um, you know, you could even take it to the foreign ministry and put it on your desk. And when you look at it, you could think of me. And she started looking at it. He's flirting, isn't he? And then I heard her say something under her breath. And by this time, she was crying. I could see tears coming down, and I thought, what did I say to upset her? And I heard her say something, and I leaned in close, and I said, what did she say? And she said, I can do this. 
Creating characters like Jim did is Tradecraft 101. But these days, there are other ways you can create different identities. We are digital spies. We go undercover, we create false personas, we take on different personalities. Creating characters to fool people is a thread that runs through espionage. But this is the 21st century. This is the online world. This isn't your old school wine and dine Roger Moore era spy work. This is cyber espionage. My name is Charity Wright. I'm a cyber threat intelligence analyst. What happens is anytime you conduct an activity or a transaction on the internet, you leave some type of trace behind. Most people do not anonymize their presence on the internet well enough. So those traces can be found if you know how to look and where to look. Charity's speciality is monitoring China. More specifically, how they are developing and conducting cyber espionage. But how did Charity draw China in? How do you catch someone in the act of digital espionage red-handed? Step one, figure out who you're going to be. When I conduct research on China, I have a set of false personas that I adopt to log into certain sites, to read original sources on Chinese government websites, to track Chinese state-affiliated media and monitor what's happening in the state-affiliated media, what their narratives are, any bias that is coming through. And I use those false personas to protect my identity as well as using technology that anonymizes my internet connections so that the Chinese government is unable to track me. Step two, know what or who you're looking for. We know that through evidence-based studies and through investigations, we know that the CCP has infiltrated government networks and private networks alike to steal data, to steal proprietary information, science and technology, to then implement in their own country, in their own markets, in their own military technology. Step three, know your enemy. Knowing how our enemy thinks, what drives them, motivation, culture, all of these things feed into the psychology of intelligence analysis. We cannot counter a threat unless we understand the threat deeply. So for us as threat researchers and analysts, it's just a matter of, do we know what their intentions are? And does the behavior and the tactics and techniques and procedures that they're doing, does that align with what they've stated they're going to do? Step four, get on the internet. From there, You'd be surprised. It starts with simple Google searches. Start with Google, see what pops up, see what people are talking about. Step five, follow your gut. I found an area that I excel in that I just can't explain very well, and that is intuition. And I think a lot of spies around the world have that intuition. Maybe it's learned, maybe it's trained, maybe it's just being a person who doesn't trust very easily, but I always encourage junior analysts and people that are new to the field that during your investigation, if something is telling you, what about this or what about that? Or maybe you should look over here, go take a peek. I mean, there's no harm in following that instinct and you never know what you'll uncover. Getting to know your enemy in the 21st century is very different to getting to know your enemy, say, 70 years ago. These days, you can do a lot through Google. But back then, it was much more about treading tarmac, much more analog. I think I should go out and do a little sexy. Cute, but don't be fooled. This isn't your usual tourist. And this isn't your usual sightseeing. This is Takeo Yoshikawa. His story was brought to life by True Spies in episode 62, The Mouse at Pearl Harbor. Yoshikawa worked in Hawaii in the Pacific Ocean in 1941 as a Japanese undercover agent during World War II. It was completely mad. Basically, it wasn't going to work. And you have to remember, Hawaii was a thousand miles from any other major force. 
people had called it an impregnable, an indestructible fortress. But I had to challenge its enormous military might. And this is something I would do primarily by knowing the enemy. Knowing the enemy. Much like Charity Wright. However, Yoshikawa's method posed much more imminent danger to himself, his nation, and ultimately the enemy. To become undercover, Takeo Yoshikawa became Morimura. His official job while in Hawaii? Working at Japan's foreign ministry. However, he was really there to gather intel on America's presence in the 50th state. At a period before the US became involved in the war. How many American naval vessels entered and exited Pearl Harbor? How many military aircraft were moving through the airfields there? What were their missions? Those are the sort of questions that could not be answered without my help. This is World War II. The threat is real and the danger is a constant. But Morimura had to do the day job he was there to do, plus the undercover work. So every time he left the office, he would don his pair of khaki shorts and floral shirt and repeat the same line. I think I should go out and do a little sightseeing. Like it just occurred to me? Oh, I should do some sightseeing. That would be nice. Beginning with Pearl Harbor, he tried to find out as much as he could about the ships at the America's disposal and the movement of troops. He would then feed the information back to Japanese headquarters. This was key information for what was to follow. Another way he got to know the enemy was chatting them up. Our 20-something spy loved a bit of whiskey and a good time. After a long day of pretending to work, Yoshikawa would head downtown to carouse with some of the American sailors, deftly prying for information. He also befriended one particular taxi driver, a Japanese-American by the name of Mikami. As he shuttled him around, Yoshikawa played dumb and asked questions. I would say things like, Hey, there's a great big plane over there. Is that for tourists? But the thing was, Mikami had an incredible amount of information at his fingertips. He could say when a certain aircraft had arrived, for example, or what it was for, or what its schedule was. The driver also introduced Yoshikawa to a refreshment shop, a spot with an uninterrupted view of Pearl Harbor's aircraft carriers and heavy cruisers. Sightseers and spies could kick back with a Coca-Cola while keeping an eye on the unguarded rear flank of the harbour. I told myself they'll be returning there frequently. Suffice to say, he did. On the morning of December the 6th, 1941, Yoshikawa took a drive to Pearl Harbour. What he saw there made his heart start to race. The entire enemy fleet was gathered in one place. Eight battleships, two aircraft carriers, ten heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and seventeen destroyers. Everything. You know what happens next. The next day, on the morning of December the 7th, 1941, Japanese forces attacked U.S. forces at the naval base at Pearl Harbor. Over 2,400 U.S. personnel died, including 68 civilians. Knowing your enemy is a common theme through all episodes of True Spies. And in Yoshikawa's case, it turned out to be incredibly deadly. Knowing your enemy was slightly easier for our next True Spy, because he was undercover at an early age. He just didn't know it at the time. Those teenage years when I was off the rails gave me an insight into how not to get caught. And it gave me quite a grounding in crime, criminality and evading the police. My name is Peter Blexley. I was born and raised in a fairly leafy part of South London. This early experience of undercover would set Peter in good stead for his very successful career as a detective for the Metropolitan Police. However, to get to that point, 
He did do some actual training, taming the lion, if you will. I walked through the front gates of the Metropolitan Police Cadet Training College, and in stark contrast to school, I suddenly discovered self-discipline, respect for others and myself, mainly because a lot of the instructors there were former Royal Marines. And when they went, Oi, Blexley, I saw you leaning on that wall, get down for 10 press-ups, or what wasn't an option. Peter rose through the ranks of the Met to eventually become a detective in the drug squad as an undercover agent. But how do you convince the crooks that you're one of them? How do you con a con man? Well, for Peter, it started with being himself, or a caricature version of himself. I always stuck close to my true personality. There was no point me trying to pretend to be a public school educated expert in fine art, for example. That just wouldn't have washed. So I used to stick to talking about the things that I knew about, which were the three Fs. Pardon the language, fighting, fucking and football. Right? I had some degree of knowledge about those. Okay, so you've got the chat down. What about the look? One of my bosses described me as an imaginative dresser. Well, at the time, Miami Vice was on the TV, so there was Don Johnson in Miami with his white linen jackets and Hawaiian shirts. And I've got to confess, I did copy a bit of that. Are you getting a good impression of Peter in his pomp as an undercover agent? How would you look and sound if you were to follow Peter's helpful guide? Well, one thing is certain. You won't pull it off if you don't believe in yourself. There had to be a bit of swagger. If you were going to convince people that you'd got £100,000 to invest in illegal drugs, you had to be the part. I would say that I ran a bar or a snooker hall and I made a few quid. I always had cash in my hand and would sometimes flash a bit of that. And I was just basically a cocky kind of South London boy done good. And last but not least from Peter's tradecraft arsenal. Well, we're not on Hollywood gadget budgets here, so you've got to work with what you've got. In Peter's case, it was his hair, masses of the stuff. Having long hair was very helpful because I could have it pinned back looking relatively smart, tied back in a a ponytail, or alternatively, because I had a mass of long, brown, curly hair, I could have it as wild as you like, blowing in the wind, looking like some kind of rock star. Some of the crooks I operated against did want to meet in posh hotels, but many of them wanted to take me to a safe house on a sink estate in a very dangerous part of London. So adaptability was key. So that's undercover. But what if an enemy surveillance unit identifies you and deploys a team to tail you? For former British Cold War spy, Dave Butler, it was a common occurrence. In the heat of the moment, you know, picture yourself rushing through a wood, doing about 60 miles an hour down a wooded track. You're trying to map read telling the driver when to turn left, when to turn... It was a bit like rally driving. If we had have been shot at, we probably wouldn't have heard it anyway. I mean, you never hear the bullet that kills you. Dave featured in episode 63 of True Spies. Catch me if you can. I served in Bricksmith, the British commander-in-chief's mission to a group of Soviet forces in Germany from uh, 1986 to 1989. Bricksmiths was a deliberately boring name, disguising a bizarre arrangement. That arrangement allowed both East and West to gather military intelligence in each other's territory by pretending for more than 40 years that the Second World War had only just finished. The British government basically didn't recognise the East German government. So therefore, that meant that us, in a sort of a diplomatic role, could basically go where we want do what we want in our vehicles and we could basically break all those speed limits, ignore police, never stop for an East German, anybody in authority. And so, yes, it was it was a rather unique position in that we could actually, you know, break all the laws, we could steal things with Her Majesty's government's blessing. 
It wasn't just the Soviets keeping track of Brixmas movements. The Stasi became like shadows, moving with them. However, they had a few tradecraft techniques up their sleeves. It was not uncommon for one tour vehicle to have up to 10 Stasi vehicles tailing it. In their mind, this was how surveillance was done. What we started to do, of course, was to record all their number plates. And we had actually what we call a narc list with us. So if we were being followed or we passed a vehicle, and the best way of denarking, as we used to call it, was to drive down a road for a couple of kilometres and then turn round for no reason and just drive straight back up the road again. The car that was following you wouldn't have a chance then to do anything, but they always put their hands up to their faces because they thought you were going to photograph them. And it was the worst thing you could do to a narc would be to take his picture or her picture because what that basically did at a stroke was struck them off from then ever working undercover in the West because they would consider that we would pass those photographs back to our own intelligence communities. But if you really can't shake them, why not stir them instead? The vehicles were very well set up in that we could isolate the brake lights or the indicators at any time by flicking a switch. So if we were being chased at high speed by the Sovs or by the Narcs, and you went round a particular hairpin bend, then what we do is flick the brake light switches. Our driver would brake hard, but of course the vehicle following us wouldn't see any brake lights coming on, so we'd think that they could take the corner at the same speed because they couldn't judge. And very often you'd see the NARC vehicle go flying off into the undergrowth, you know, because, <laughs> because the corners they should have braked on, they didn't because they couldn't see our brake lights working. I suppose that was a fun thing to do as well. The Bond gadgets are good, a key in the world of espionage. But when you need information from someone, you need their trust. And how do you gain their trust? You find a connection, a common ground. But in the world of espionage, more often than not, the asset you're trying to recruit is from a very different world to you. And that common ground is hard to find. That first meeting, I think a lot of it was my lack of self-confidence and hearing the voices in my head over and over again, like he's never gonna wanna work with you, he's never gonna give you intelligence. And he's probably sitting there thinking like, who is this white chick? This is Shawnee Delaney. She worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency from 2005 to 2014. Shawnee was tasked with gathering tactical information on America's enemies in the Middle East. The US military's failure to apprehend Al-Qaeda kingpin Osama bin Laden was the source of constant irritation, if not embarrassment. It goes without saying that tracking him down would be a career-making coup. Exactly the kind of opportunity that somebody like Shawnee can't help but chase down. It fell to her to recruit this asset. We will call him the Mullah, who had close ties to Osama bin Laden. A bit of background on the Mullah and how he came to be sitting in an interrogation room across from Shawnee. It helps to understand what comes later. The Mullah was a committed fundamentalist, but he was a complicated one. He was very close with his father and his father, after the attacks on 9-11, his father called him up and berated him and knew that he was involved to some degree and told him that he needed to get out of Al-Qaeda, that this was a bad organization, it was toxic, it was killing innocent people, etc., etc. And that really cut this guy deep. It really hurt him. He, he took it to heart. He mulled it over for a very long time. Before you come over all misty-eyed, we should reiterate that, fundamentally, the Mullah's politics hadn't changed. He did believe he wanted that Islamic state, but the way that Al-Qaeda was going about it, he just couldn't support. His father then moved to the United States. So that was a, an additional pull, like... Now my father lives there. Um, his father then died and is buried here in the United States. And it just always ate away at him. And so he ended up breaking from the organization and, and walking away. It was after this ideological break that the DIA had identified the Mullah as a potential source and why he and Shawnee are now in a room together. So Shawnee and this Mullah have been having meetings for a while, but he had not been formally recruited yet. The only way to make this official is if he takes money. 
What? It's a psychological motivation, right? Like you're now indebted a little bit. It's a little bit of control. It's a little bit of just part of the process where you want to see if that person's going to follow your directions or kind of fall under your spell, if you will. Money makes the spying world go round. But this Mola keeps refusing the money. How are you going to get him to take it? Well, you first need to understand the motivations of the person opposite you. And Shawnee identified three things. He's a family man. His kids are everything. He's a scholar, a Hafiz. Someone who knows the Quran off by heart. Thirdly, he is, or was, very close to his father. His father's respect means a lot to him. It took me about five months to figure out how I could recruit him and how I could get him to take money. Shawnee was pretty sure she had a foolproof plan. The first part of that plan? Go shopping. I went to a bookstore and bought the biggest, fanciest Quran I could find. Very, very fancy. And when he unwrapped it, I had in my mind prepared just a really beautiful, heartfelt speech about our relationship and how much I appreciated getting to know him, because I truly did. And I knew that this would be special to him and he was special to me. And he teared up. It really hit him. So I think that gift was actually a big contributing factor to him accepting as well, because I had empathy. He saw like I understood him as a person and he felt heard and respected and valued. Respect, isn't that what anyone wants? And once you get it from someone, a mutual understanding is formed. And with that, trust. And this is where Shawnee hits him with the second part of the plan. And what it was, was his motivation for his kids and their education. He's a scholar and a Hafiz. He values education deeply and he wants the same for his children. Can you see a similarity with Jim, who appeared earlier on? An element of sociopathy has to run through every operative in a clandestine world. And in Shawnee's case, I had a, a fat envelope with a wad of cash and I had it kind of hidden. And after I did the pitch, I told him, look, this money is not for you. And he just kind of looked at me with a little smile. And I said, after this meeting, I want you to go straight to the bank and I want you to open a bank account with your eldest son's name on it. And I want you to take this money and I want you to put it in that bank account. You are not allowed to spend it and you are not allowed to keep it. And he just got this happy smirk on his face and he kind of leaned back and I said, this money is for your kid's college education. And he leaned back, he took it, slid it back and put it in his pocket and said, thank you. I think that's great. The last part of the plan, act three, if you will. Shawnee knew that his beloved father who had emigrated to the USA had recently passed away. And he had lamented several times that he never got to see his father's grave. I told him, you know, I understand that you have never been able to see where your father was laid to rest. And I know that weighs heavily on you. I would like to be your eyes. And I give you my word that I will go to his grave and I will pay my respects on your behalf. And he, again, he teared up. He was emotional and um, he was like, thank you. Thank you so much. That would mean the world to me if you did that. And that, that got him. He was hooked. And she followed through on her promise. Commitment to the cause. And with that last masterstroke, the Muller signed on the dotted line. Identifying a weakness in an asset and exploiting that weakness is key to the success in recruiting that asset. But why do people divulge information in the first place when their backs are up against the wall? Fear. Fear of death. Fear of being exposed. Fear of not having enough information. Why gather that information in the first place? You could say fear is, and always has been, the main driver of all espionage. Prisoners who didn't respond to our questions were told that they were going to be turned over to Russian captivity. We're back in World War II. It's 1944, the last embers of the war, but it's more dangerous than ever. Guy Stern is working for the survey section and his job is to interrogate German prisoners of war. 
They feared retribution and uh, so that was a threat which we played to the hilt. When Hitler's forces had mounted their invasion of Russia, they had committed war crimes against prisoners of war. That invasion had ultimately failed, but the Russians were out for blood. A Soviet prison would not be a welcoming place for a German soldier. Fear. We had to prove that the danger of being shipped to a Russian captivity was not an idle threat. Enter Fred Howard, one of Guy's comrades in arms. Born Manfred Ehrlich, he, like Guy, was a German Jew who had found shelter in the USA before the outbreak of war. And so we became a team, Fred and I. When we interrogated, he became the soft-hearted, good-hearted, running over with the milk of human kindness kind of American. And I became the hard-headed, nasty Russian. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. Good cop, bad cop. And to play the part of the hot-headed Russian, Guy spared no expense. And so I had a Russian accent in my German and uh, the realistic outfit, the uniform, the medals, and my accent convinced him that I was really what I pretended to be, Commissar Krukov, a uh, name that was later translated for me because it meant Commissar Hook. You did not want to make Commissar Krukov angry. So uh, Fred would start and the prisoner would just say, I don't have to answer that. The Geneva Convention only requires name, rank and serial number. And that was that. Then Fred would say, oh, uh, I I feel so sorry for you. I, I see you have just started a new family or you have a very good job in civilian life in Germany. Much of that taken from documents that the German carried with him. And, you know, I hate to tell you this, this Russian is horrible. And the prison, what I hear sort of from that prison where they incarcerate prisoners of war, it is frightfully primitive and people die there. Nice guy, Fred Howard, has laid the groundwork. By now, the prisoner is sweating. Who is this Russian anyway? He called the prisoner over who had been turned over to this horrible Russian me. And uh, I had a, a fit of anger for some reason or other at the prison, uh, saying to Sergeant Howard, What kind of a specimen are you giving me? He won't even make it halfway to the salt mines. Confronted with the fury of the ersatz commissar, most prisoners would shrink away. And why wouldn't they? Even the Americans seemed shocked by his brutality. Fred then said, look, I just hate what you are doing. That's not the spirit of the Geneva Convention. Disgusted with his Soviet colleague, Fred moved to take the prisoner away, back to safety. And the prisoner would follow or come closer to Fred and uh, the Russian would have another fit. This is my prisoner and this is Russian soil. You know, that kind of thing in German, of course. Now your prisoner is ready for the killing blow. Killing with kindness, of course. So, uh, Fred would say, look, give me some information and uh, I can tide us over. And of course, that what became a very full-fledged interrogation that Freddy then staged. A wolf in sheep's clothing, if there ever was one. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Join me next week for another edition of Tradecraft Secrets with True Spies.